When you put your heart and soul into creating something, you don't want it to be good. You want it to be great. What does it take to get there? I'm Questlove, and this is Quest for Craft, my collaboration with the Belvini. A deep dive into the obsessive, never-ending, whatever-it-takes journey to create something extraordinary. When you think about time and creativity, you usually think about timelines and deadlines. But instead of just constraining us, can time actually inspire us? Today, I'm joined at Electric Lady Studios by the punk rock icon, Patti Smith. Hi. Hi. Who's been recording albums here for over 40 years and was actually sitting in the stairwell with the studio's founder, Jimi Hendrix, the day it opened. Do you still get a feeling about Electric Lady every time you come here or is the myth of it over? Um, I feel every time I come into Electric Lady, I feel privileged. I feel excited. I feel humbled. I was maybe 22, 23 years old, and I was invited to the opening party. And so I was here. It was uh, really? August 12th, I think, 1970. And Jimmy was on his way to Isle of Wight. And everything was as it was. I mean, the murals, everything. It was Jimmy's world. You know, it was intergalactic. And uh, I just couldn't bear, bring myself to go into the party. And he came out and he saw me sitting there and, uh, you know, he said, you're not going in the party? I said, oh, I'm a little shy. And he, and he told me that he was shy too. And he told me his dreams for the studio. But one of the things is he wanted to go off like in Woodstock or something with musicians from all over the world. And he wanted them to sit in a circle for months if it took with all instruments out of tune with each other and play and play until it went from a, like a Ornette Coleman decophony to something harmonious. Right. And he said, the language of peace, you dig? And I was like, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As a young girl who wasn't a singer, wasn't ever thinking of doing a record, I never dreamed that he wouldn't come back, but I would be going into his studio to record my first single, my first album. It's still brings tears to my eyes. Every time I come here, I know that he did not come back to realize his dream. And it's up to all of us every time we do something here to get put a little bit of that mosaic to get that universal language. There was a quote of yours where you said that um, you haven't fucked much with the past, but you fucked plenty with the future. Um, what exactly does that mean? Well, when I was young, you know, I had a lot of vision, what I thought would happen in the future. We all do. We all dream of, we have great dreams. We have hopes for things. And, you know, we also have quite a bit of hubris. And I had all of that. But in this time in my life, I feel sadly that, you know, some of the things, the positive things, a lot of the, a lot of them didn't evolve or other things happened. But the things that we were concerned about, like environmentally or anything else that we thought would be way in the future, the future is now. It's happening now. So all of that churns in my mind. But I have to say, I feel quite emotional even thinking of that because I spent the last few days watching Summer of Soul in tears over and over again I watched it because that that by the way thank you I'm oh. sure a lot of people are thanking you for doing that one of the fellas said something about Nina Simone and he said she could both you know sh with, I, I forget how he said morning, it morning he felt her hope in her morning at the same her time. hope in her morning yeah. wow yeah. that I feel that hope and mourning in me right now. And when you say, what, what do you, what does it mean uh, fucking with the future? Uh, right now, I just, I just want the present to be good, you know? Right. Like Patty, watching the footage from the Harlem Cultural Festival had an undeniable effect on me, opening a window to the past that transformed my present and is shaping my future. Like film and music, Art can give us the same sense of being fully transported 
in time. Why? Conservators might have the best answer. Paintings are physical, tangible, historical documents. They get dirty and they discolor, but they don't age like a person does. We start by thinking about the past as we analyze the work, but every piece of work that we do is future-oriented. A good restoration addresses basic problems with a painting. It's been torn, it's covered in brown goo. A great restoration is a process of becoming acquainted with and then uncovering a vital spirit that's in the canvas. You can feel a connection not only to them, but you feel a connection between the subject and the artist who created the piece. We're traveling in the past, and in a way, they are communing with a future. We tend to clean a painting following those original brush strokes. So our hands are literally tracing the path that the artist's hands took. If you and I were to take a walk through the Metropolitan Museum, for instance, we would see hundreds of works of art from the Congo in the 1850s, Greece in the sixth century BC, ancient Egypt, and on and on and on. It's mind boggling. And all of the people who did those works, with few exceptions, are dead. But as you walk from object to object, all of those works of art and their creators and their cultures are existing contemporaneously in my reality. The time distance is immediately collapsed. It's like what they theorize happens with the wormhole. You go in here, you come out there, and you're instantly in the same space with this 150-year-old object. When I was a kid, 1999 seemed like the future. Like, I imagined what, you know, what an 11-year-old imagines the future. Is. Oh, we're going to be flying in space and wearing spacesuits and whatnot. And it's kind of weird. Like, now my thoughts of 1999 are just like the, the, that tacky denim outfit that Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears <laughs> wore on the MTV wear carpet. Like, oh, that's 1999 to me. It's like, that's not the future at all. For you, what did you possibly think the future was and when, in your head, when would it happen? Like, I think what, I, if anything, I've learned is, it's like travel. Mm -hmm. Anything that you think it's gonna be, it's never like that. It's always like something else. So you have to keep yourself open for what it, it's going to be. If you want to really have it, uh, you know, a, a, a good life, you have to be open for a wild ride. How does it feel to play or share new work that you're working on now from your heart versus songs that have aged with like fine wine and, and that are sentimental to your audience? In recent years, I haven't written that many songs, truthfully, um, but what I have done a lot is I really like covering songs. I love doing other people's songs. Often they're disastrous. <laughs> you covered a Prince song. Oh yeah, we did that good though. Right, I was about to say the first time. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, it was, <laughs> sorry. It was, it was Dove's Cry. Right, I was about to say, you recorded that here, correct? Yes, in fact, yeah. For you though, coming from a seminal album that's in its like 45th, year, I believe, do you find yourself trying to twist it into another song, or, or are you straight no chaser? I only sing songs that, um, whether they're mine or anyone else's, that I have a, that I'm in touch with, that I want to sing. It doesn't bother me to sing, uh, you know, Because the Night for the 10,000th time, because the people like to hear it. And, uh, and I wrote the lyrics for my my late and beloved husband, so I can just think of him and, and sing it. But if I feel disconnected with a song for whatever reason, then I don't do it. And I've even, if, if we're on stage and I, st and I, I try a song or it, the night is weird and, and the song feels false, I'll just tell the people, like, I can't do this song. This is like... You'll probably stop it? Oh, yeah, I've stopped. I mean, but I talk to the people all the time. You know how like, I remember... Elvis Presley used to say that he made a career on his lip, on his weird lip. Right. Well, I've made one on disasters. People like, I think they actually come to see me to see what disaster I'll cook up. <laughs> but uh, what I learned really young is if you just, if you have a sense of humor and keep in contact with the people, uh, they'll ride with it. 
they're, they're, they come there to be with you. And so I've, I've learned not, not to worry about it. I mean, it's just rock and roll. It's just communication. You know, I would rather have a big disaster and make people happy and give people a good laugh than do something, you know, that's, you know, uh, technically perfect. Or phoned in. Yeah. There you go. For me, this past year or so has been all about reaching back into time. I DJed sets that pulled up deep hip hop cuts and paid tribute to artists who have passed. I directed Summer of Soul, a documentary feature that recovers a specific moment in time. I wrote a book called Music is History that looks at how we understand history through music and vice versa. When you connect to the work of the past, you are connecting to the past. But that connection is a complicated circuit. When you hear Stevie Wonder sing, Never Had a Dream Come True, you're hearing 1969 when he recorded it, but you're also hearing all the years that informed the way he was singing it. You're hearing 1970 when he released it and the world that it entered. Art exists in more than one time at the same time. By digging into the past, by carving out space for the future, we craft better work in the present. Maybe this is a drummer mentality. We keep time. You and I have both written memoirs, and you know, of course, that requires you to look back and reflect. So what was the process like for you? Well, uh, the book that Just Kids. Just Kids. And why did that take you 20 years to write? It was excruciating. Robert Mablethorpe was my best friend. He died at 42. And the night before he died, um, he asked me to write our story. He didn't want to be remembered as someone who took explicit photographs and then got AIDS and died. He wanted people to have a wider perspective of him, but there was no one that could tell that story because no one knew us. We were just unknown. We were kids. And I wanted it also to honor him. I wanted it to be as close to art as possible, but also because Robert didn't read much, be a book that a non-reader could like. So I really wanted to make it seem like a film, but it did, it took a long time. And I always tell people when they, you know, get discouraged, you know, that book, I promised uh, I would write it in uh, 1989, mm -hmm. and it came out in 2010. Okay. Right. So it, it did, it took a long, long time. There is one nice little, little uh, postscript to this. I never cared about money. I mean, I came from a lower middle class family. I just did not care about money. I only cared about art, really. I just wanted to be an artist. Mm -hmm. And Robert always worried about money. He always worried about money. He always worried about me. Um, he say, you're not going to be successful. You keep doing these weird things on these records. We, we, <laughs> you need a hit. <laughs> you need a hit. That's right, what he would right. say. Patty, where's the hit? And the book that he asked me to write has been my most successful thing I've ever done and has given me uh, the, the lion's share of my income as, as, as a worker. If your mission is to make something, you need to have a close relationship with time. Some days it'll screw with your head, but other days it will give you the inspiration that gets you going. And a challenge you put off for years can become the saving grace of your future. A deeper appreciation of time is definitely required to craft great whiskey, something that's always on clear display at the Balvini Distillery. The time spent passing down methods over generations, the time that whiskey spends maturing in barrels, the decades spent watching over it, nosing it, tasting it, until the time is right to share it. It's easy to make time your enemy, something you have to race against but maybe do the opposite. Make friends with time, pay attention to it, collaborate with it, treat it with curiosity and grace. It might literally be your most important creative tool. For you, as far as, far as time is concerned, what is the life lesson that you've, you've learned? 
Well, I think that, it, you know... I know it's a loaded question, but... No, I mean, I'm... Well, I, I, I think that I've learned that you have to... Um, well, life, it's, it's like it's a package. You know, it's a package deal. You know, we love our life, we're going to lose it. We love uh, the things that, that we have in life and we're going to lose many of them. Mm -hmm. But we have to accept it as a package. I mean, I look at my life, I've lost a lot of, you know, my husband who I really loved, I've, he was my king. Mm -hmm. um, my brother, Robert, my pianist, my parents, my dog, mm -hmm. you know, my friends. And, um, but on the other hand, I have my kids, I have my work, I have my friends, and I have every day, you know, something new, something interesting, a new thought, a new idea, a new line, um, a new book that somebody writes, a new piece of music, and just the landscape. I, I just think that we have to just be grateful for the small things and just be grateful for just simply being alive, having our breath, having our creative impulse, and just uh, start with that every day, except that we're gonna have some rough things in life. Just know that it's part of the package of being alive. I love being alive, mm -hmm. and uh, I have a lot of rough moments and or sorrow or any of that, but also I'm just, I'm just so happy to be here. In fact, my mantra is, from Jimi Hendrix, which is the line, hooray, I wake from yesterday. I love that line. I often think when I wake up, even when I have a headache, I think, ah, another day, I have another day on earth, another day to make change or to do something cool or, or to, you know, just experience breathing. So um, I don't know if that answers your question, but that absolutely answers it. That's, that's, wow. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.